Why do you look so angry, in my opinion at least? You know, honestly, I couldn't answer that question. I have no idea why I look angry in your opinion. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. Well, the channel just hit 20,000 subscribers. In fact, I looked a few minutes ago and it's over 21,000 now. And I just wanna say thank you. I continue to be amazed at the number of people who are interested in what I do here in my little shop. You know, I'd be doing this stuff anyway and I'm just glad to have the opportunity to share it with like-minded people around the world who share some of the same interests that I do. In honor of the channel hitting 20,000 subscribers, I put out a post a few days ago asking for questions. I've got your questions right here on my phone and I'm gonna to try to answer some of those today. What's your profession? If it's not electronics slash engineering, how did you come to know so much about it? Well, my formal training is in computer science. That's what I have my college degree in and that's what I do for a living. I work for a large company doing software architecture, specifically uh, cloud security. And you know that's what I do for a living and everything else is just a hobby. And it's mostly self-taught. And this is something that has just been a part of my life and a part of, of, of my makeup for as long as I can remember. There's a story in my family about when I was five years old. My mom came into the room and she found me on the floor with a screwdriver with the parts of her Electrolux vacuum cleaner spread all around me on the floor. And she just had no idea what to do confronted with a five-year-old who had just disassembled her vacuum cleaner. And I just wanted to know how it worked. I didn't know how it worked, so I took it apart to see how it worked. She didn't know what to do, so she just told me to put it back together, and I did, and she's still using it today. And this is kind of the story of my life. I've always been curious. When I was oh, probably middle school age, maybe a little younger, I got a uh, toy car and it was a little red plastic car and you'd pull the string to wind it up and then let it go and it was mechanically programmable. You could turn the front wheels at some angle and then there was a little caster wheel that would pop down in the middle. You could set it to another angle so that it would drive out turning one direction and that wheel would pop down, it would turn a different direction and then it would pop up and it would, it would drive back. So you could program it to drive loops or figure eights or to go and make a turn and go someplace else. And so it was kind of a mechanically programmable car. And I wanted to know how it worked, so I took it apart. And it were two plastic clamshell cases on the gearbox and you take the top one off and there were all these gear shafts and they're like four silver gear shafts with nylon gears in them. And I was looking at them and the cams, trying to understand how it worked. And I couldn't quite picture, I could see the gears, but I couldn't, see in my head how they were interacting. So I pulled the string so I could see them in motion. And of course, you know what happened. It just exploded and they went everywhere. And to my credit, I found them all. I figured out how they went back together. I put the whole thing back together, but it was never the same again because I didn't have the cams timed right. And so it, 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 it worked, it ran, but I couldn't program it like I did before because the wheel was coming down at the wrong time. So, but it satisfied my curiosity. And then um, when I was in you know, junior high, high school, I had the opportunity to work with a program called uh, PCS. And it's a long story, but uh, today you would probably call it an after-school STEM program. And Patrick McShane had set this up as a school and he was trying to figure out the business model, but basically he was giving kids like me who had an interest in technology an opportunity to play with things and to get resources that their parents or their families really couldn't provide. And he had a big Lego lab with you know tens of thousands of pieces of Lego Technics with motors and gears. And so you could build robotics. They had a mini computer in there uh, that was donated by a local company that ran Unix. And so we all had Unix account logins you know, in, as middle schoolers or junior high in my case. And so we had access to stuff that we just didn't have access to in the schools. And um, I got into electronics there. I was very interested, had all the Forrest Mims books from Radio Shack and Radio Shack was the only place you could get stuff at the time for hobbyists. You didn't have the maker community like we have today. And so I was piecing together circuits with uh, you know, TTL logic chips and triple five timers. 
And I ultimately, when I was a sophomore in high school, built a robot. And the chassis was made of Lego, so it was just tank style steering little car with infrared sensors and touch sensors around the sides and a layered AI system. Now AI at the time was not what it is today. It wasn't trying to figure out what to advertise to you. We were really at that point like emulating insect neurons and the, the nervous systems of insects and trying to figure out how to layer behaviors. And so this was just a little TTL logic and triple five timer sequencer kind of layered system that would allow this thing to run around on the floor and interact with its environment and run away from things and appear to get bored and then wander off. And uh, I entered that in a competition uh, from Duracell and the National Science Teachers Association and ended up getting a $10,000 college scholarship from that. And then that got me the attention of the governor, state of Idaho, and I ended up with another 10,000 from the state of Idaho. And it pretty much just paid my way through college. By the time I got to college though, I was not really interested in electronics. I'd kind of burned out on that because of all the work that went into the robot. And uh, so I decided to go into computer science. And so that's what my formal education is in. But over the years, uh, my employer has provided me with access to a machine shop. And you know that's where I kind of got a little bit of training in safety and learned how to use a mill, learned how to use a lathe. Uh, there was a 3D printer there that I could get access to. And I eventually bought a couple of uh, 3D printers on my own. And you know everything else is kind of just what you see, the stuff that I'm, the little projects that I'm doing in general, I don't know everything I need to do, need to know when I start a project. So I get interested in it and I learn it. And every new little project builds on what I know. And I learn some new things that I need to know in order to complete it. And I just keep moving. And so you're looking at the product of what, you know, 40 years of starting by taking apart my mom's vacuum cleaner and then gradually just continuing to learn because I'm curious and because I want to know more and I want to be able to do more and acquiring tools along the way. When you decided to buy a mill and a lathe, what made you to decide to buy a new machine? Would you do anything different if you decided to buy machinery again? Thank you for the great content. You've helped me countless times. You're welcome. I'm glad that what I do here can be useful. I have certainly taken advantage of the maker community and all the great content that's out there to learn what I know. And so the opportunity to give back is something that I, I feel like is, if not an obligation, it's something that, that I want to do. I want to be able to give back to that community. So why did I buy new machines? Um, you know, I looked around. Part of the issue is I live in Idaho. If I lived in the Rust Belt, it would be possible to go pick up a Hardinge HLVH lathe in bad shape for not too much money and rebuild it. But where I live, there's not a lot of used machinery on the market, at least not a lot of used machinery that's in really good shape. You know, you can get the occasional bridge port, but generally they're in pretty bad shape and they, they fetch a, a pretty good price. So I decided to start with this, with this Grizzly uh, mill, and uh, honestly, I've been pretty happy with it. You know, it's not a big iron machine, but it's also not a mini mill. It's, it's got some weight to it. You know, the cast iron table is like 75 pounds. The thing actually is rigid enough to do some serious work with it, and I've enjoyed that. The lathe I've got over here, the Geo 602, same thing. It's a 10 by 20 lathe. It's got plenty of power, especially now that I've switched it over to uh, VFD, and it's got enough rigidity, plus it's, you know, it's a project. You've seen me working on it, and you'll see me continue to work on it. The compound needs some work. Would I do it again? Probably. I might go a little bit heavier on both. I might go a little heavier on the mill and on the lathe. I probably would do something the same because I, I also just don't have the space here. I probably would do something very, very similar. And when you get into these small machines, you're talking, you know, a thousand, fifteen hundred bucks. I might go for the Precision Matthews variant of this that has the power crossfeed. But the power crossfeed is kind of the only thing that I've really missed, aside from Gearbox, which is the whole point of the electronic lead screw project. I would love to know your path when it comes to school and career choices. Where did you learn your skills and get your passion for these types of things? Well, I've already discussed some of that. In terms of school, you know, I'm really glad that I went into software because while there still are jobs in electronics engineering, which would have been my first choice, 
a lot of that stuff's not in the US anymore. Now, we're gonna see if there's gonna be a resurgence of that kind of stuff, but generally the electronics are going the way of commodity and the software right now is where the action is in terms of uh, ability to have a career and derive a, a decent income. Is that gonna change? Yeah, probably. They've been promising the machines will be writing software for as long as I've been writing software. It hasn't happened yet, we'll see. And if it does, if the machines are writing the software, then I want to be working on the machines that are writing the software. So, yeah, we'll see. When are you gonna build a fully CNC turret lathe? Uh, you know, I get a lot of questions. Uh, the turret lathe is a unique twist here uh, about whether I'm gonna CNC the lathe. Uh, I probably am not going to, honestly. With a, a lathe this size, rigidity is always an issue and turning the hand wheels and feeling what's happening and dealing with stringy chips and dealing with chatter is something that's kind of a feel thing. And I don't think on a machine this size and weight, I don't think I'd be happy with CNC because I think I'd be just constantly fighting cut quality and, and stringing and chip formation issues. I think I'm gonna leave the lathe manual. Um, the electronic lead screw makes a huge difference because I can just dial in thread pitches and thread. Um, and you know, I also kind of enjoy turning the hand wheels. On the mill, now that it's completely CNC, I miss being able to just throw a block of steel in there and make something. I gotta go to the machine, I gotta, or I gotta go to the, the computer, I gotta work up a drawing, I gotta work up the programming. You know, you can kind of do some stuff by hand, you can kind of do some stuff with the wizards, but you know, sometimes I just want to grab the wheels and uh, make something, and you know, I kind of miss the ability to do that. So I honestly wouldn't mind having a manual mill in addition to the CNC mill, and I'm probably gonna leave the lathe the way it is for now. What do you use your lathe and mill for when you're not using it to make improvements for itself? Uh, this is a good question, uh, because that's all you've really seen me do is use my tools to make more tools. And, uh, you know, it's a good hobby. And that's kind of what this is, is a hobby for me. I do run it as a business. I do have an LLC and I do, you know, pay my taxes. And um, in general, the tools pay for themselves. When I started out with the 3D printers, it was because I was interested in 3D printers, but it was also because I wanted to make things. I was into radio control aircraft at the time, and there were lots of things, motor mounts, firewalls, um, uh, wingtip plates, uh, servo protectors, uh, mounts for various kinds of things. There were all sorts of things that I wanted to be able to make, and a 3D printer was a good way to do that. And so that was my original application. And in fact, I ended up designing and selling quite a few 3D printed radio control airplane parts, and it was enough to pay for both of the printers that I have. So those machines are working machines, they're fully depreciated, they paid for themselves. Uh, when I got the CNC mill, you know, it's a, at times a $1,200 machine, it's probably closer to $1,500, $1,600 now. Then I probably spent a grand or two doing the CNC conversion, especially since I started cheap and ended up upgrading a few things. But that machine has made enough hobbed bolts for my 3D printer extruders, which is another product that I've been selling that that machine's paid for itself. And there've been a few little projects here and there that I've done for, um, for sale, but the hobbed bolts are the primary use there. On the lathe, the la I haven't used the lathe to manufacture anything for sale yet, but the lathe was a test bed for the electronic lead screw. And that project has generated enough revenue to pay for the lathe and to you know, pay for um, you know, the parts for the experiments and parts for ongoing videos. And so you know, this is a hobby that's kind of been paying for itself. Everything that you've seen on the channel is stuff that has been paid for with money, bootstrapped out of the business um, of the hobby. So you know, to have a hobby like this that pays for itself, you know, that's kind of my only goal right now because I do have a day job. I've toyed with the idea of making this a full-time thing, but uh, mm, I kind of like having my corporate benefits and health insurance, so I'm not ready to do that just yet. What triggers you to share your knowledge for, quote, free on YouTube? I appreciate your videos as it enrich knowledge. I'm from Mauritius, I hope I pronounced that right, and many thanks for these hardworking videos you make for us. Well, you're welcome. Um, I'm really glad you appreciate it. What triggers me to share my knowledge you know, kind of teaching is one of my strengths. It's kind of one of this, kind of the way my brain works. I, 
am always curious about how things work. And then when I figure it out, I want to talk to somebody about it. I want to share that knowledge. And this, so there's kind of an internal drive there. There's also kind of a sense of responsibility for all of the amazing stuff that I've learned from other creators who have shared their knowledge and mentors who have invested in me. And having the ability to put that investment into somebody else makes me feel like I'm paying my way. It makes me feel like I'm making a positive contribution. And that makes me feel good about, uh, you know, uh, uh, about my place in the world. So I think that's probably why. Any plans on upgrades to the ELS project? A touchscreen would be awesome. Uh, I get this request a lot, honestly, for the touchscreen. I did not go with the touchscreen originally because I thought that the hard buttons would suit the needs that I had and that they would be more appropriate for a shop environment. I'm imagining greasy, oily fingers with chips stuck in the cutting oil and then touching a touchscreen, and that was not my idea of, of, of uh, a good idea for tools, and so I didn't go that direction. That said, enough people have been talking about it. I did grab one. I've got a little uh, industrial interface board, and I played around with it a little bit. That's probably not going to be a big focus for me. You know, if I get bored someday, I'll probably look at it. But uh, honestly, the buttons for me, the ELS, I want it to just be, I'm trying to replace the gearbox. I didn't want to buy a $10,000 lathe where I could go, oh, I'm going to thread this and turn a couple of knobs and then do it. I wanted that functionality where I can just, you know, push the buttons and get that same functionality out of it. And the push button interface gives me all of that. So I'm not really planning on going much further. There have been lots of questions about automatic multi-pass threading or auto stops. And, you know, the hardware's there and the software's open source. And if there are people out there that really care about that and have the inclination to do it, you know, um, I, th I think what I've put out there is a good platform that people can take and start from if they want to do that kind of thing. I'm probably not going to pursue it. There's a whole handful of things I still need to get back in there. I want some safety stuff. I want some overhead, overspeed protection. Um, obviously, the power button doesn't do anything and the settings button doesn't do anything. The idea is the power button would disable the motors and shut it down. I see somebody put in a uh, pull request for that. I haven't looked at it yet. I've been just completely swamped with all this COVID-19 stuff uh, that I've been working on. But, uh, you know, I will get back to that at some point. And uh, I also would like to make it so you don't have to program everything in, uh, in, and then reprogram the board after editing the config file. I'd like to be able to put all the parameters in, hit the settings button, and scroll through the settings. Again, and it's working. It does the job. It's super useful. All that stuff is nice, and I will get back to it someday. And there's a community of people that have been picking up and running with this too. So you know, I don't know exactly where that's going to leave, or where that's going to where that's going to lead. I would love to know how do you get the ideas on how to improve your machines. Congrats on 20k. I live in Argentina. You're worldwide. Well, thank you. Uh, I, it it does feel good to see the audience growing, to see people all over the world taking an interest. I will apologize that uh, I'm a little white boy from Idaho and I just speak English, but um, I do really appreciate the, the global audience and the global conversations um, of people all over the world able to share their passions. So what's the, pl uh, uh, how do you get the ideas? Uh, I tend to be, some people are very experiential where they just have to just start and fiddle with things and sort of get ideas from doing. I tend to be more on the intellectual side. I tend to think about something and I have a really hard time starting it until I have an idea in my head of how it's going to work. I tend to think very spatially. And so, you know, on the 3D printer extruders, those pretty much came out in the first iteration. You know, I, I changed some of the requirements and did some other versions of them later, but I kind of didn't start modeling it until I had an idea in my head of how it could work. And that's generally how it works. I'll maybe try to start on something, and if I don't really have a good idea, I'll just put it aside, and then one day I'll be in the shower or out taking a walk or under a barbell, and all of a sudden I'll have an idea, or I'll wake up in the middle of the night and grab some paper and start scribbling and uh, go and do it. And so that's kind of how it works for me. I just roll ideas around and I roll problems around in my head and I worry about them and it keeps me up at night. And then all of a sudden I have an idea and I pursue it. And so that's kind of, that's kind of how my brain works. 
Um, may not be healthy, but that's how I that that that's how it works for me. What's the plan for finishing the new spindle for the Geo 704? Still dying to see it mounted. Yeah, I'm still dying to see it mounted too. Um, I was getting ready to do that, and two things happened. Uh, the COVID-19 thing hit, and I got involved in 3D printing, as you've seen in previous videos, just massive numbers of uh, face shield parts. The parts, I got them down to you know under two hours, and I believe I've printed 375 of those. So 375 two-hour print jobs it takes up a lot of time. So that's hurt me. The other thing is I'm working from home now and no longer have access to the shop at work. And I've got a plan for a mount, I've got diagrams, but there's some details. The exact spacing of the mounting holes, the spacing of the register boss um, behind the mill head. So I have to take the head off of the mill to take those measurements. And then I've got to put it all back together and tram it back in to then make the part so I can take the head off again to put the new mount on for the new spindle motor. And I really wanted to just take it off once, take the measurements, finish up the parts in the shop at work, which I don't have access to right now. But it's looking like that may be more of a long-term thing, so eh, I'll probably bite the bullet and get started on that again soon, especially since the peak of the uh, 3D printing for the COVID-19 parts is, is kind of past now. How about adding the cross slide to your electronic lead screw program? Uh, you know, I, I've talked about this a little bit. Uh, lots of people would like to have the cross slide involved in that. Um, I think there's a couple of things you could do. You could set it up to do facing, just basically as a feed screw on the cross slide. But I think what people are most interested in would be able to to set it up so that you have start and stop points and it'll actually just do the multi-pass threads on its own, feeding in and feeding out and taking the multiple passes. And that's starting to get into the territory of CNC and that's starting to get into the territory of having to worry about chip formation and loads and chatter and all that kind of stuff. I haven't been anxious to jump into that. Um, again, I was just trying to replace the gearbox and I'm pretty happy with the simple device that does what it does and does it well and does it without really intruding into the workflow. And so, um, we'll see. Uh, I'm, I'm not in a hurry to get into that. Um, at some point I'll get that thing polished, but uh, I don't know if I'll go that far. You have a three axis mill. Any plan for a fourth or fifth axis? I've always been mesmerized by simultaneous five axis milling. Yeah, it is pretty magical, isn't it? Um, I'm not planning on going five axis. I do think that a rotary axis would be nice, an A axis, and in fact, I built a rotary fixture for machining the hopped bolts for my printer extruders. If you search, there's a uh, video on the channel showing how that works, but it's like a little small fourth axis that just takes an individual bolt and spins it for, for cutting those, uh, cutting, machine the teeth in the bolts. And so I do have that. I do have the output for another motor, but I've not gone as far as putting together a, an axis with a chuck on it or a collet or anything like that. That's certainly something for the future. Honestly, what'll happen is I'll have an idea for something I wanna make that requires it. And so then I'll build the tool so that I can do it. That's generally how it works. How much time do you spend in a month or a week for YouTube editing and filming videos? <laughs> a lot. It's more than most people understand. I think most people have an understanding that putting something together takes time, but it really depends on what you're doing and how you're doing it. If you're just turning on the camera and letting it roll while you work on something, it doesn't end up being a huge investment. If you want to make it concise and you want to convey the ideas or you do what I'm doing with multiple camera angles and really trying to condense it down, it takes a lot of, a lot of effort especially since you've got limited battery life in the cameras, so it really makes sense to get everything set up and be able to roll through, which means you gotta have a lot of prep time. So I'll spend hours, days, weeks, thinking about things, ordering parts, figuring out how I'm gonna do something so that once I have the cameras rolling, I can optimize that time. And so generally, your average video, once all that prep work is done, which varies, I'm generally going to spend about four hours in the shop with the cameras running to end up with about a 30 minute video. Um, and so that's going to end up with, well, you know, a considerable amount, maybe a hundred gigs of uh, video data that goes into the computer. And then the edit 
and color correction and audio processing and rendering, um, you're even without the rendering, you're probably talking about anywhere from three hours on the edit to 10 or 15 for again, a half hour video. And then you render it and then you look at it and then you realize the mistakes you made and you have to go back and fix stuff uh, before that gets uploaded. And then you gotta, you gotta make thumbnails and I've got a blog, the blog posts have gotta go up and you gotta go back and set up the end screens and everything on YouTube. So it's a considerable investment, it really is. What happened to the electronic lead screw board? It's been out of stock for a while. Also, can you put together a plug and play package for the ELS please? Uh, the boards are not out of stock. I have them listed in two places. I have them listed on my website, cloud42.com, and I have them listed on eBay. And honestly, I got slammed when they first went up. And I ended up with, like in the first two or three days, I had like 175 packages to ship. And the eBay shopping cart experience from my end of generating the shipping labels, getting it sent out, handling international, that has been really smooth. I pay for it but um, because they take a cut, but it's really smooth and easy for me to handle. The stuff on my website is quite a bit more work. I got to cut and paste addresses. I got to keep track of everything. I got to cut and paste uh, tracking numbers and get them back to you after you place an order. So, um, and I also don't have inventory management between the two. So I've got a certain number in stock. I list them. I put some on my website, some on eBay. And like when I run out on eBay, I go look and readjust the numbers. And it honestly just became so much of a pain. I just let them run out of stock on my website and I've been selling them on eBay. And I've got some up there now. There are still more coming. If you search for it on eBay, you'll find my listing. I can put a link down in this video. But they're there and they ship worldwide. So they're absolutely available. I just haven't gone back and adjusted the stock numbers on my personal website because the process of selling them through there is more of a pain for me. Can you put together a plug and play package? Um, I'm probably not gonna do that, and here's why. There's two reasons. One is that there's not a lot of value I'm adding, right? When I design a circuit board, there it's open source, you could make them yourself, but there's some value that I'm adding in having those manufactured in bulk, assembling the kits, and selling those, and I make a profit for that. There's margin that's added on to that. The cost of that board to you is considerably more than the cost of one unit purchased in bulk. So that makes it worth my time to put those together, and it makes it worth your, your time because you it's worth the money to you in general, I mean, it seems to be, people are buying them, because then you don't have to go source all that stuff. If, if we go to putting together turnkey kits, there are kind of two problems. One is I don't have any source for the parts at the kind of volumes that I would be contemplating that are any better than the sources that you have. You know, buying a servo motor, buying an encoder, I've provided links to those uh, so that you can go and buy those. I can't buy them at any better price and I'm not really adding any value by buying them, storing them, and then putting them in a box and shipping them. The one thing that would add value for the average person who buys a kit is I'm telling you this will work and I'm taking responsibility for selecting the components. The problem is every lathe is different. There's so such variety out there, there's no way I can be an expert on all of that. And for me to take that on and advertise to you that I know what you need for your lathe and if it doesn't work, you can just call me and I'll take care of it for you, I'm not ready to sign up for that, not in the broader sense. If I were doing this full time, I would get, uh, I'd figure out the popular lays, I'd get one of each, I'd work this whole thing out, I'd have customer support, but I have a day job and so I really don't see that as something that I'm gonna get into anytime soon. Your multi-camera setup really shows professional quality for a one-man show. If I ever take recording videos seriously, I'd like to do something similar. Could you go into some detail behind it? Maybe the things you found work and don't work. Sure, um, for video, uh, my standard advice is there's two things you need. The number one thing you can do to make your video better is to improve the audio. If I tried to use the audio on the camera, you'd hear me, but it would be echoey and off in the distance, and you've all seen videos like that. And most people won't tolerate it. The, uh, if the audio's not good, they just move on. They'll forgive issues in the video before they'll forgive issues in the audio. So if you want the audio crisp and clear and present, uh, the lapel microphone, I guess over here, is the, is the way to go. And I've got one on my shop apron, I always use it. 
It goes to a wireless mic that's connected to an outboard audio recorder that's separate from the camera and I sync up the audio in post. Second thing you want if you're shooting video is light. Get way more light than you think you need and then double it is my standard advice. In this shop, this is maybe 600 square feet. It's a two bay garage that I'm using and I've got 10 LED shop light fixtures, all the same color temperature and I think they're 4,000 lumens each. So I got 40,000 lumens just in a two bay garage and I would say it's just barely enough. I mean, you see the quality I get, it's pretty good, but there are times when the cameras are gained up and things are grainy and I wish I had more light. So get all the light you possibly can. Um, what I'm doing generally is I'm running multiple cameras. I've got a DSLR, in this case a Sony Alpha. Um, that's the camera that you're looking at me with right now. And then I generally have a collection of GoPros on C stands or light stands or other stands that I've made or 3D printed parts for so that I get coverage from a bunch of different angles. And honestly, the reason I did that is so that I don't have to plan every shot in order to show you what I'm trying to show. So if I'm cutting on the mill, I'll have uh, something zoomed in right where the cutter is to get close-ups of the cut. I'll have a shot over near the computer so you can see me, what the controls on the computer, and I'll have a wide shot so you can see me grab tools out of the drawer and load them. And so then I can just start all those cameras and just let them roll, and I can go about my work. So that then in post, I bring all that stuff into Premiere Pro and I set up a multi-camera workflow where I take all of the separate cameras, all the separate video files for all the separate cameras and the audio file for a shot, combine and synchronize those together, and then as I'm editing, I can cut between the different cameras in addition to you know, cutting for time and cutting chunks out and, and uh, trying to cover up mistakes and make myself look smart. Great videos and congrats on the milestone. I've been dying to see how you're gonna finish the spindle build. I bought an S30 for my router after seeing your first installment and stuck a few points. It'd be great to see how you tackle mounting, Mach 3 or 4 interface, tool changes, air controls, air pressure, interlock. Well, thank you for the congratulations. Um, I'm pretty excited. I am gonna get back to that project. Uh, I do have kind of a plan sketched out for a video on the interlocks for the tool change so you can't eject the tool while the, the spindle's turning. Um, I will get back to that. Like I said, the, the COVID-19 stuff that I've been working on has just sucked up all of my time. And uh, we will be getting back to that soon. Nice, congrats. I have a question on what's your favorite size end mills for a machine your size? Uh, short answer for a machine like this is quarter inch. Um, and the slightly longer answer is this is not a mini mill. This is something larger. Uh, I don't know exactly what you'd call it, but it's in the three to 400 pound range. Um, and so it's got enough mass, it's got enough cast iron in it, it's got enough rigidity to take some decent cuts. You can throw a three inch fly cutter on there in aluminum. You can throw a two inch, two and a half inch cutter in there and cut steel, though you're really starting to push it and you're gonna have to be careful. But in terms of aluminum, I love the YG1 uh, Alu Power end mills. They're polished, you know, geometry specifically for aluminum. The quarter inch just cuts like butter. The 3 8 inch works fine, but with the TTS tool holder system I've been using, they tend to pull out if you're not, if you're not really careful and have them tightened within an inch of their lives. Uh, so that's a little riskier. In steel, quarter inch carbide works Great cuts like butter, no complaints. Uh, 3 8 inch roughing end mills, especially the uh, powdered metal YG1 roughing end mills. I run a 3 8 inch in mild steel and that just plows material out and works great. But you kinda have to keep an eye on it because it is a light machine. You seem to have a lot of capability in a small space. How do you think about shop arrangement workflows and what isn't allowed to come into your shop? Uh, honestly, I'm terrible at this. You've seen the behind the scenes video of my 3D printing areas and it's a wreck. And same thing here, everything that's not in view of the camera is generally where I put the things that I had to move to get a clean shot in view of the camera. And so, you know, I tend to try to keep this white space here on my workbench clear so that you have something to look at that looks nice. I can turn the cameras on and get a good shot on the bench. And I generally keep the machines clean and the chip trays cleaned out and all the tools put away so that I can work. But 
every place else is stuff that's abandoned projects. Right down here at my feet, there's the old uh, motor that came off of my lathe. I've got an oxyacetylene torch sitting down here. The end of the bench down there beyond the uh, surface plate with the cover on it, which has become a collection point of everything I set out of the way while I was shooting a video. There's a pallet on the floor on skates that's got all the stuff for the, the mill spindle. My table saw back here has got camera gear all over it. You know, it. How do you organize a shop? Uh, I'll give you the same, the same answer that Dave Jones gives. This is not a production shop. You don't want to model your shop after this. This is a television studio. This is a YouTube studio. So, you know, I make it work and I generally just move stuff out of the way. And so it's not always the most efficient thing. You probably shouldn't model your shop organization off of me. Do you have plans to upgrade the transmission of your Geo 704 to belt drive? What solution do you recommend? Yes, I had plans to do this about three years ago, never got to it, I actually have the belts already. And now that I'm switching to a high speed spindle, I think that's gonna be a better solution, so I may not ever get back to it. In a nutshell, the plan was to uh, rip all the gears out of the headstock, <clears throat> put a belt on the motor and a belt on the top of the spindle. So there's a, a couple of carrier bearings and there's the gear drive with the splines to drive the, the spindle inside the quill. And lots of belt drive systems either replace that part or modify that part. I wasn't gonna do any of that. On the very top, there's a little shoulder and there are two M3 screws that hold the, uh, the light wheel on for the tachometer. And what I was gonna do is machine a pulley that registers onto the top of that carrier, sticks up about an eighth of an inch, um, and I was gonna read, you know, a couple millimeters and actually register it onto the top of that so it fit tightly and then hold it down with those two M3 screws. Believe it or not, I've run the numbers and with 12.9 hardware, two M3 screws should be plenty to hold that down as long as all the lateral forces are taken up by the, uh, by the shoulder register. So that was the plan. Uh, so I could do that without modifying the mill in any way. It's on the back burner since I'm pulling that head off to, to put the high-speed spindle on. And uh, you know, maybe I'll get back to that someday, but it'll be one of those things where I need to machine something bigger that's gonna take more torque than I can do with the high-speed spindle, and so then I put this head back on and maybe play with it. Hello, love the channel, thank you. I'm thinking about purchasing the same 440V Vice for my PM30MV CNC conversion. How do you like it? I love it, I would buy it again. Um, the price was right and you know, comparing it to the Kurt vices and other vices that I have access to in other shops, it compares very well. I've been very pleased with it. There are some other CNC vices and orange vices that look really sexy, but man, the prices, uh, the prices match. So in terms of a, kind of a medium weight vice on a hobby mill, this is a four inch version. I'm happy with it and I would buy it again. It's probably just a tiny bit too big and because of the way it fits on the table and hangs off the back, it loses me I don't know, three quarters of an inch to an inch of my Y travel, but uh, that said, I'd probably buy it again. Congrats, how did you get so masterful on Fusion 360? Sorry, there's no magic, the answer is practice. I've been using it for years and I use it all the time. I'm constantly sketching things out that I'm 3D printing or fixing things around the house. I need a knob to replace something that my kids broke off. You know, it's been years, right? I haven't had kids at home for a while. Um, but I just use it all the time and it's become second nature. I started with uh, SolidWorks and when I first switched over to Fusion 360, it just broke my brain because there were so many things I loved about SolidWorks like the parameters and the configurations um, and the way the mates worked instead of the, the way the joints work in Fusion 360. But once I kind of got my head around it, I watched a lot of videos from other people. Um, I, I watched a lot of stuff from John Saunders early on when he was more kind of teaching rather than showing the cool thing he made. Um, he's kind of drifted away and I'm not getting as much from that now, but you know, generally there's, there's a lot of good tutorials out there. And so my goal when I show that stuff is to kind of show end to end, like I have an idea and here's what I want to do, talk about the strategy and then actually run it end to end showing the detail because 
so many tutorials out there just show you one little thing and when I have a question I'm thinking well how do I make this work I go out and I find somebody who technically showed me how to make that work but didn't get me any closer to making my thing work because some detail was left out and they didn't really show they showed oh here's how you make a joint they didn't show me strategically how do I decide where I want the joints and uh, so I try to show that stuff but the answer to how I got good at it is just practice and ultimately you want to get to the point where you're not thinking about the tool you're thinking about the thing you're making with the tool um, on the last video with the drill press I got a lot of comments about about uh, moving through fusion quickly and doing things and how did I learn to do that well I've gotten to the point where I have a standard set of things. You know, you sketch, standard constraints, mirrors, uh, equals constraints, different things. They're just in my toolbox, and so I'm visualizing what I'm trying to build, and I'm not really thinking about how I'm using the tool. And that's where you need to get if you want to get really good with this stuff. So, do you primarily use your workshop just for making tools for the workshop, or do you have other hobbies, pastimes, work interests that call in the workshop facilities beyond what you make videos about? Uh, you generally see most of what I do. Here on the channel at this point. Uh, I kind of got into the 3D printing because I was into radio control aircraft and wanted to make parts. And in general, and then I got the mill because I wanted to make hobbed bolts for the 3D printer stuff. And then I got the lathe because that's what you do is you buy a lathe. And I had lots of things I wanted to make, but it's not a production shop. Um, the tools earn their keep. They make parts that I sell to pay for the tools and pay for the next generation of tools. But um, Generally, you see most of what I do unless it's repetitive. Like just this last weekend, I ran another batch of hobbed bolts for the printers. I already made a video about that. There was nothing interesting or new, so I just came out here and did it. And honestly, I kind of enjoy just coming out here and putting parts in the machines and running them and not messing around with the cameras. But, you know, I do it for you guys. Congrats. Thank you. Any plans to add an automatic tool changer to your CNC mill? Uh, no, actually, I don't have any plans for that. A mill this size and this kind of class, I probably am not really going to let it run unattended, so I'm going to be here. And so there will be an automatic tool changer in the new spindle, but I'm not going to run it in automatic mode. I will grab the tool, hit the foot pedal, pop it out, pop a new tool in, suck it in, hit the go button. I'm probably not going to have the machine going over and picking the tools out of the rack though that is entirely possible. It's just a matter of programming and rigging up the rack, but I'm not planning on doing it at this point. What are your plans for your CNC? Any other tools you like or planning to have? You've seen a few things. Um, I want to get the Heimer that I've got still sitting here in the drawer set up, and again with the new spindle, there's, there's a bunch of things in the way. Um, I've got a Heimer, That's, that really interests me. It should make things a lot easier. I've got a whole backlog of things that I want to make, but generally what happens is, I don't plan too far ahead, I generally think about, oh, I have an idea, I have something I want to do, or I have something I need, and then I think, well, I don't have the tool for that, so I need to make a tool so I can do that, and oh yeah, well, I don't have the tool I need to make that, so I'll make a tool so I can do that, and it's just tool inceptions, tools all the way down, and so that's, uh, that's generally how it works, so I don't, I don't generally have a huge master plan don't forget to smile. Okay, I won't forget to smile. How do you get max torque from a VFD? Thanks for sharing your knowledge. Um, VFDs generally have a couple of modes. They have a voltage frequency mode where the voltage goes up with frequency, and they generally have a... I cannot remember off the top of my head what it's called sensorless vector drive mode where they actually engage multiple coils in the motor at the same time and essentially create a, a rotating magnetic field and they can actually then leave the current in the motor high as they're running at very low speeds with all of the coils engaged and it's called sensorless vector drive mode so you'd want a VFD that supports that you'd want a motor that's rated for it you want to have adequate motor cooling because the fan on the motor generally doesn't spin and so you'd have to do the research for your application but the sensorless vector drive is generally how you get higher torque out of a motor down to speeds as low as one tenth of the nameplate speed on the motor how would you go about adding backlash compensation to ELS? I have a 90-year-old ideal lathe, which has obviously been around the block a few times. I know it's a lead screw. A new lead screw is the obvious first step, but do you think it can be accomplished with your setup? 
Um, I'm going to say you don't need backlash compensation. This is a confusion point that comes up over and over and over and over again. But with the, with the threading, you're going to back up and you're going to make a pass. And all the backlash is going to come out of the system and you're going to be pushing in one direction against the lead screw in the compound and against the lead screw that's actually driving the threading. And then at the end, you're going to back out of the work and then you're, you're going to unhook the, you're going to unlatch the half nut, you're going to back up, you're going to lock the half nut again and make another pass and all the backlash is going to come out of the system. So you don't need backlash compensation for threading, whether you're using a real gearbox or whether you're using the ELS. It's just not necessary. Now, if you are doing metric threads with an imperial lead screw or vice versa, then you're going to leave the half nut locked and you're going to back up. And if you tried to back up without retracting the tool, then you are absolutely going to crash the thing because the back backlash is going to go the other direction and you're not going to follow the cut. You're going to be running the tool backwards and plowing into your work. But if you back the tool out, then back it up, then run it back in, and then make another pass, you're always going in the same direction. So you don't need backlash compensation for that. How do you balance life, engineering, work, and YouTube? Can you walk us through a typical week, day in the life? Amazing output. How do you make the time? Uh, how do you balance? Uh, poorly, uh, probably. You know, I, I don't watch television. I don't watch, I, I spend a lot of time on YouTube following other creators, but you know, I don't watch sports. Um, this is my hobby, so I'm not burning a lot of time. I don't have kids at home. That doesn't take up my time. So I'm generally working a 40-hour week, uh, my day job, but I start very early in the morning. I'm generally up at 5.30 in the morning, which gives me time to kind of get through, you know, media, other things that are kind of coming in, package things that I've got to ship, uh, get into my email, do stuff. I generally get to the gym. And right now my gym's at home because uh, the gym's closed. And, uh, you know, so there's an hour, hour and a half, and either that'll be in the middle of the day or it'll be at the start of my day. Um, and so then, you know, evening rolls around and I'm generally exhausted. But as I said earlier, most of my ideas and most of my, um, most of the work and the prep that goes into a video is reading or it's just thinking. And so I'll read something, I'll have some ideas, and then maybe I'll go for a run, or maybe I'll, you know, be working or sleeping or, you know, whatever else I'm doing, and my brain kind of processes this stuff in the background. So yeah, I do spend a lot of time at the computer researching, reading, planning, trying to figure stuff out. Um, I tried for a long time to get a video out every week, and man, it is just a, it's just a grind. And so I finally let myself off the hook and figured, Video every two weeks is fine. YouTube algorithms don't like that. It hurts my subscriber growth and you know, talking to other creators. Yeah, if I wanted to do this full time and wanted to build it, I'd be grinding a video every week, but um, you know, that's not what I'm trying to do here at this point, so I, I don't. So generally, I've got my work week, Monday through Friday, and I'm generally trying to kind of do enough in the evenings to think about what's coming, to get parts ordered, to do the planning, to figure out the 3D models, to print things that are gonna take a long time so that I can shoot on Saturday. And so get up early in the morning and start shooting or early in the morning, be done by noon. And then I can do editing Saturday, Sunday, maybe into the evenings of the following week, get something uploaded. And I've been trying to hit Thursday morning uploads. I've been doing a little experiment now, trying to shift that back in the week. But you know, I basically don't do anything else. You know, I don't have any kids at home, and so this is kind of, I spend a lot of time in the shop or a lot of time doing the prep work or the editing. So yeah, it sucks up a lot of my time. And uh, you know, it's, I probably couldn't do a video a week long term. It would take a tremendous amount of effort to make that happen. You pronounce your surname Clow. Yes, I do. In England, it would be Clough. Where's your family f from originally? Uh, I am told, France, specifically Normandy. The name was originally pronounced Clough. In fact, it was spelled C-L-U-F-F-E. I don't know exactly how all of that changed, but yeah, I am told that it means the ravine men. And again, it originated in France in Normandy. I am told, I don't know how reliably, that uh, the first person with my name who came over to the New World was named John Clough, C-L-U-F-F-E. 
He was on one of Columbus's later voyages, not the first one. And he was not on the ship's manifest, probably running from the law. Uh, that's all I really know. I do know that there are a lot of other people named uh, with the name spelled the same, C-L-O-U-G-H, but pronounced Clough. And there are several in the town where I live, and we get all kinds of interesting calls. I've gotten phone calls telling me about the results of my pet surgery. I got a phone call once telling me that my Porsche was ready and I could come pick that up. Had somebody in a truck show up with a bunch of building materials, including a bunch of roof trusses they wanted to drop off at the little house that I was renting. Uh, not for me. So yeah, yeah, I'm aware that it's Clough. A lot of people do pronounce it that way, but uh, we pronounce it Clow back as far as I know, and I don't really know why. That is all the questions that I've got. Uh, so I think we'll call it here for today. If you're enjoying these videos, give me a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe to the channel and uh, leave me a comment. If anything that I said today piqued your interest, or if I mentioned anything you'd like to see more of, let me know and we'll see what we can do. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.